Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fantastic Gnomon live stream. I'm your host, Chris. And before we get started, if you're looking for any closed captioning, please head over to our YouTube or our Facebook page. Next, we'd love to thank Dell and NVIDIA. Without them, we wouldn't be able to provide you with such amazing content as tonight's event. Finally, if you have any questions for this evening's presenters, please leave them in the chat. I see. I see I see y'all. This chat is, is really coming through. No, it's not pre-recorded. I'm right here. That'll be the only question that I'll answer right now. No, I'm joking. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. So go ahead and populate all your questions in the chat. 
and myself and what I like to call our ninja moderator will store all the questions to the side. And at the end, we'll be sure to try and get through as many questions as we can with our presenters. Um, another thing to note, I feel like this goes without saying, but <clears throat> if you haven't seen the show, might be some spoilers. So uh, spoiler warning in case you're coming here thinking that there was going to be none. Uh, just a heads up. So <clears throat> I have a lot to say about tonight's event, um, and I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as possible, and I apologize for rambling. Some of you, you've come to these streams before. You're familiar with me. You might know a lot about me already. For those of you who don't know anything about me, uh, I'm very, very proud, and I'm very vocal about who I am and, uh, and where, where I'm from. Uh, I'm something that is called uh, Yonsei within the Japanese American community, which means I'm a fourth generation Japanese American. And growing up, my grandmother would take me to a theater in Little Tokyo called uh, Aratani Theater. Shout out to Aratani Theater. And at that theater, she would show me a lot of things that were really hard to see at that time. So very anime, uh, really great films that were from Japanese creators. You might be familiar with some of them. Uh, Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, you probably already know who I'm talking about, the renowned Akira Kurosawa. The, these things were very difficult to come upon when I was younger. And it's, it's really, 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 really great for me to be here at Nomen because I get to just be around these people that do things that are just, they just mean so much to me because you have to understand that when I was growing up, I didn't get to go to a Regal. I didn't get to go to an AMC to see these things, you know? And it was just the community that I was around and my grandmother who had pride in this stuff that would take me to go see these things. And I believe that the people that worked on this show, they make me feel proud. They really continue that work. I think even though the content itself is more accessible than ever than when I was younger, the people that worked on this piece of art, I feel like they've taken no shortcuts and they've really shown respect to the subject matter from the commons to the, you know, the Izume dying, a lot of the specific colors, these things, they're, they're very important and they're ingrained uh, in who I am. And I'm just so, so proud and so happy to be a part of this live stream. And, you know, I think this is definitely a world that my Bachan would have been very, very excited to see. I'm ready. I even brought my own little uh, come on here <laughs> in, uh, in kind of uh, uh, just excitement to be part of this. And in case after I'm talking about all of this, you still have no idea what you're here for, uh, Ninja Mod, why don't you go ahead and show them right now what everyone's here for. What is a sword? It is a line. On one side of the line is life. The other, death. Steel. Is pure and impure. And these together, there can be greatness. No one man can defeat an army, but one creature can. Please give me the strength. I do not know their names. I do know their fate. What are you? I have a name. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our amazing panel, 
We're blue eyed samurai. Hi, everybody. Really, I'm, I'm going to get an applause button one of these days because I, I know yeah, that yeah, they're yeah, I know yeah. that they're clapping from behind their computers. Uh, Jane, oh, if, you, if you would, please, uh, huh? please introduce yeah. everyone. By the way, thank you so much for that prep on on introducing our show and that countdown thing was so epic. My God, I've never been introduced like that before. So this is awesome. We're so happy to be here to share our show and the making of with you guys. And I brought my team along. My name is Jane Wu. I'm the now executive producer and director of Blue Eye Samurai. And here I have Toby Wilson, our production designer. And then I have next to him, Brian Kessinger, mm -hmm. our char lead character designer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then below me right here is our di art director, Emil Metev. Did I screw up your name? <laughs> and then uh, below Toby is James Wilson, another uh, art director. So we have the two Wilson brothers here. Anyways, um, and this is we we have co you know mm -hmm. several more uh, leads in our team, obviously, but we brought what we could. Um, to, to come along to talk about the show for you. And um, I just wanna give you a little introduction of how I got on the show. Um, I got on the show late 2019. I heard about the show, Netflix came looking for me. And um, Mike Moon at the time, who was the executive at Netflix said, he didn't know anyone else that could direct and lead the show except for me. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, just read read the script. And I did. And um, I knew exactly what to do. And um, what pushed me over the edge to take this job was the thought of somebody else doing it wrong. So yes, I am spiteful. <laughs> so, um, but with that, our show is completely, um, completely greenlit, completely produced during the height of the pandemic. We didn't know how to work um, remotely, but this team figured it out. Now we don't know how to work in person anymore, <laughs> but uh, with, with that anyways. And um, this journey took me personally four years from beginning to end uh, to do. So it was quite a journey. It was a long journey. And um, I had, st I started out my career in animation and then I had left for live action for the longest time. So this show is my first return back to animation and um, it's it's quite a nice return. So with that, um, the team and I would like to show you a little bit of behind the scenes and how we made Blue Eye Samurai. Hit it, Toby. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Anything else you wanna just talk about before we like jump into the full presentation? um if if you guys want to add how like uh how long you've all spent on this show uh what was your good. duration on the show got it so i've been on for about three i was on for about three years just under three years so and um keep keep track guys we're gonna give you a, this presentation is just a uh sampler platter of everything and whatever we're talking about if you want to jump back and we get to q a you just let us know we'll come back to any of these images and we can get into more detail so uh but here we go let's get behind the blade um so you know like jane read the scripts was blown away how are we going to make this um and well you always start with research right because like chris was saying you got to pay respect to the culture. So we always start with that. Uh, be authentic to the time period, the culture. And, uh, you know, Jane was adamant about, you know, wanting this to look handmade. So characters looking 2D, handmade backgrounds. So we had to come up with, okay, well, where are we going to get that inspiration? Obviously, ukiyo-e woodblock prints works perfectly for animation. And, um, you know, we wanted that, Jane, you wanted that tech on concrete kind of line work, yeah. right? Tech on concrete um, was, is one of my favorite anime movies of all time. And that movie never left me. So when I had an opportunity to design this world, um, there, there was a lot of inspiration that I drew from that film. So, um, 
and we'll get a little bit into that when we get into the character <laughs> aspect of it. But um, so in in the environment part, so Toby, if you want to talk about environment, if we can go down to our first visual. Yeah. So when we're creating this Edo world and we're looking at ukiyo-e prints, the, the North Star for us was an artist by the name of Hiroshi Yoshida. So if you haven't seen his work, you should take a look. It's like, so Mizu is half Japanese, half European. So she's a hybrid. Our show is a hybrid. Um, so we are working with a French studio, working on Japanese culture. And Hiroshi Yoshida, Japanese artist, born and trained in Japan, but also trained in European oils. So he was very familiar with Western type composition and traveled the world. And just his sensibilities was a perfect hybrid blend for our main character and for the show. And that also meant we looked at using elements like Notan as a principle for how we design our shots. So using the, that principle of the pattern of light and dark and how we're grouping our contrast. Um, I'll just keep clicking through some of this stuff while we're talking. And that coupled with Kiroskira, which, you know, when we're looking for some dramatic lighting on our characters, we use a single light source for that drama, but we keep it flat to match our Noten Ukiyo-e style and to like do diligence to our source inspiration. So that's a little bit of backstory of kind of what sort of inspired the look of the show. Um, I'm gonna kind of kick it off to Emil to elaborate a little bit more of how we contemporize that because that's that's the historical context. And then Emil, if you yeah. wanna talk about that. Yeah. Well, uh, as uh, uh, Toby mentioned before, it's uh, it has to have the two uh, D uh, beautiful look of a of a film and a and a story that it's told within this kind of a parameters. And how do we do this? Basically, using our artistic skills and our uh, you know knowledge in in uh, what uh, is the most important thing is how to tell this story uh, in old Japan in in our uh, contemporary world, which is 21st century and quite a bit of centuries passed since what happened then. And uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 threats that we wanted to avoid is not to stay within the kind of a mediocre a uh, realm of that we have some examples here and there. I'm not going into there, but uh, and as Toby mentioned, uh, one of the skills is the principle of not down. And what it what that means is uh, basically organizing the composition, the uh, uh, the shapes within big masses, and all these masses have certain uh, uh, details that indicate what they're made of. That allows not to organize the composition in big, great shapes to, uh, to get to this uh, epicness of, of that we were looking for, but also to uh, organize the color in a mass that we can have a lot of freedom to, to to have it on the screen without explaining every single detail. So what did we do besides this uh, was uh, simply having brush strokes that are very expressive, uh, that can uh, uh, portray certain objects or, you know, uh, uh, landscapes and so on. But what one of the biggest principles within this uh, expressive brush strokes was to be organized within uh, a silhouette or a shape that we can recognize without even seeing the details and the details were substituted by the brush strokes and the expressiveness of you know the, the splashes that they had but everything was controlled within within these shapes so uh Basically, uh, this is the uh, one of the main principles that we, we uh, use to keep it 
fresh, to keep it contemporary uh, within the, uh, uh, you know, the, the parameters of the historic, uh, uh, you know, principles that we had to be very faithful to. So, Toby, you want to go on after? Yeah. And, you know, Jane, that was something you were looking for too, right? You wanted to have, see the hand of the artist, see a little That's bit right. of, you know, That's that right. impressionistic feel, right? That's right, yes. So, um, I, the, the, specifically in this, in this, um, can you go back to the first uh, slide, Toby, again? I wanted to point out that the reason why we put in the Edo build to show you guys was that we had to recreate Edo as it was during that timeline and we had to get it right historically so we looked into old maps we built that one street we had to make sure that we knew where the sun was coming from and we had to we had to be locked into all of our like emil says our parameters as best as possible because we want even if this is animated and this had expressive brush jokes and everything. We needed you to believe in the world. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we needed you to, this world to be grounded was there was so much drama in this story. And when I talk about drama, I'm talking about adult subtext and complexity. And these things all need something to be grounded on in order for you to believe that these characters do exist and this world does exist. And hopefully what I was trying to create is that you forget you're watching animation you are just really experiencing this world. And it, did, it, it didn't have to harken back to animation or live action. It was going to be something in itself. And just, just to bounce off of what you just said, when you're talking about, we were basing it off of old maps and everything. So we did end up for, this is particularly, specifically episode 108, the, the uh, season finale. And so you can see in the bottom left, we've got the, the palace there. And you can see in the center of the screen kind of this uh, old Simon or like pizza looking color wheel. And you can see where how that palace and the surrounding city fits within the 10 square miles of the Tokyo Bay or Edo Bay of that period in time. And James, if you want to jump in here and help me out and explain this, like we, you know, we were building out the whole city and finding a modular way. To, to make sure that we could build this without having to build thousands of unique structures? Yeah, the, as art director, communicating all this information to the art department, we had a big team of artists and the everything that we were trying to uh, contribute was to back up what Jane and Tony talking about, so getting that authenticity of the city because once we once we established the, the authenticity and the beauty of the time, then we can start to push the imagination from that point on um, with how authentic the art the beauty is. Then we can start to tell a story uh, of imagination. And um, for instance, in Edo, there we followed an aesthetic that was we, we needed to lean into the modular aspect of the architecture of the time mm -hmm. and also the aesthetic um, and then when um, <laughs> when we wanted to once we established that how in uh, to talk, Toby you go ahead I'm, I'm, <laughs> no worries so you the the japanese culture and architectural style lends itself to a modular build and so we get something that works for us for our series in order to, in order of producibility but it's also culturally authentic so you can see like in this environment here you know you can create these rooms modularly and you can use the shoji screens and everything and then the way that we get some uniqueness in there is with the Biobu screens and with the wall paintings and the wall art. Again, just trying to find these opportunities where we can get our inspirational source into the show. Um, and as I'm clicking through some of this stuff, uh, you may have noticed like on this screen here, 
you know, bottom left, we've got what looks like 3D buildings because they are. Um, the backgrounds here look 2D painted because they are. Uh, and then here, when you look at the at, at the like the world build, those 10 square miles that I was talking about, we've got mountains and painted. So just to break it down, how we work, we, we're doing this 2D stylized look, but we we have 3D characters, but we don't have the 100 to 250 million dollar budget. So how do you how do you make that stylized look without spending years to make 3D look like 2D? Well, you do it 2D. That's right. That's right. right. We did so, two and a half D, right, James? We did two and a half D, and not only that, we uh, our show entire show was produced on an out twenty year old outdated game engine called 3D Studio Max. That was not fun, <laughs> but um, we did it anyways, and uh, we wanted a. We still wanted to celebrate animation. It's not like we're trying to um, make this hyper real. We still wanted the art, the beauty of what paintings and animation can can bring to the table but again how do you ground it so that you can tell a very complex story that has subtext and so forth right um i also want to point out that as you are looking at all these slides um i hope some of you are thinking wow this is a lot of detail this is a lot of quality work it almost looks like feature quality and yes that's what i asked my team to do because I, when I first started pitching for the show, I said, I want a blue eye samurai to be what Game of Thrones was for TV, which was to take television a notch up in terms of quality, <coughs> excuse me. So these guys that you're seeing here all on the screen are all what I call my Navy SEALs. Um, they are so good at what they do. Uh, you have to, you basically have to hit this on your first try. There's no second try, there's no third try. And um, it makes me so happy to see such wonderful expert work uh, in, in the first stroke. So um, it's, it's, a, it's such an awesome team. Um, and we got to say that's credit to the whole team too, Jane, because we had a lot of artists working on this. So we had the pleasure yeah, yeah. of leading some amazing yes. art warriors. Very, very amazing, yes. Um, particularly, can we go to the, the Great Fire? Because I'd love to um, sh just talk a little bit of that. So this was the huge, we got to burn down the entire city of Edo, of Japan, right? So that was, you know, that was quite exciting. Um, but all of us art leads were talking about how do we do this so it's not at night? Because typically when you have fire, you want to do it at night. And we had just gotten out of that huge fire in Los Angeles that we were all trapped in for like two weeks in that god awful smoke. And my house was like right, right at the epicenter of that fire, right? So the sky looked alien and there was just nothing but choking smoke. So I kind of like put it out to the team. I said, why don't we do this fire in the middle of the day? Because we had all lived through that experience. And instead of instead of talking about fire, we talk about smoke and how unbelievably um, hard that was to breathe. And so James uh, did a lot of these wonderful paintings and the quality of just the, the, the quality of the smoke and, and, and the almost the romance of it was just absolutely amazing. I think that, I think that we were trying to shoot for sort of a hellish nightmarish <laughs> planet yeah. mars kind of yes. vibe and and i think it really had another worldly kind of feel and yeah, yeah i'm so happy we did see that. How that ramps. see how yeah. it kind of ramps there in the ending of act two and begin and act three of the last episode and this is this is a, a good indication of how the cuts the color script works in the show it's very orchestrated. Yeah, well, for 108 specifically, like Jane was saying, we staged it during the day and the whole idea was that it was set against the spring Matsuri. So it's this beautiful springtime with these cherry blossoms and you have this horrific event where an army is invading to take over all of uh, Japan and to kill the Shogunate. So 
it was just really fun designing this beautiful day and have this army invade in, in high noon almost, you know, a la Western style. And, uh, and then, yeah, blot out the sun with the smoke that Jane was talking about. Um, and then also as you're looking at the color keys, hopefully you're seeing that a lot of it kind of almost looks like photographs. And one of the things I wanted to do on the show was utilize natural lighting. And I think that's something in animation that we don't do quite a bit is take advantage of what natural lighting looks like. And uh, it, it just it's just turned out so gorgeous because if you have natural lighting, you can you can hyper some some of some of the colors here and there just to push those elements a little bit more. Right. So um, mm. that that can be emphasized a little bit more. But absolutely, yeah. the whole entire show was created based on East and West philosophy of like the cinematography, I really wanted to harken back to the old West. And um, of course, in the subject was Eastern subject, right? So I call this an Eastern Western. Um, yeah, so we, we... we weren't scared to, well, also we weren't scared to go dark. Mm -hmm. We went dark. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And so you were mentioning cinematography, Jane. So if I can, like, like yes. one of the reasons why we went two and a half D is because we act, and like I mentioned, we not we designed the sets obviously, but we built every single set. And so you have a volume set. And the reason being is because you, like, one of the gauntlets you threw down was we need to target that live action camera feel, right? That's right. For this drama. That's right. So one of the things I wanted to do also was to introduce lensing in every shot. Um, because, you know, in live action, that's what a director does is he runs out there with his scope and then lenses up, right? So um, I want to make sure every single shot had a lensing assigned to it and let the camera tell tell the story. And I think that's that's part of the epicness is knowing how to use the lensing process in order to expand the shot when you need it or to, you know, go, go tight on it when you need to um, with lensing. So all of our sets were built in simple geos first so that we can scout, do a virtual scouting so that we understand where, which direction we're looking at. And again, this is also when we start to really take account for where the sun was coming, where the sun is going what time of the day that would be. And we really try to treat this like a real set. So we would go in there with our camera and step through our lens packages to see what lens worked and how we may want to stage it. And once we have all that set um, decided, we would then start storyboarding it. So when we do our virtual scout, the directors there, the storyboard artists are there. Toby and his teams are there. The producers are there. We we are all deciding this at the same time. So that's pretty much our pipeline. I just told you a secret to our show, so <laughs> take it. Um, and, and it's it yeah, it's it's all based on live action lensing. And I'm gonna just try to wrap up this environment thing really quick, because so we can get the characters and let Brian do some talking here, because yeah. the world is for we design this world for our characters and their stories. Um, so with those two, 3D builds, with the, those actual cameras, just so that you guys understand how the, the magic sauce works is, then we did actual full 3D layout, but then that 3D layout is used to generate 2D plates for the 2D background team to paint. So that whole thing where I was saying like, well, we don't have $250 million in six years to make 3D look 2D, we, we just painted it. Our, our, we had some amazing background artists, Silver Up Spirit in France, and they just killed it um, making these these backgrounds. And we used technique, three different techniques, one being camera mapping. So if you think of the old school Disney multiplane camera, so that you have multiple layers of depth, flat paintings that are uh, oriented towards camera, like the multiplane, that's camera mapping. We use projection mapping, where if you need parallax, you need to see some volume change, like the camera's booming up and you need to see the side of the object as well as the top. Then you have some rough geometry and you project uh, the paintings onto said geometry. So you can see that parallax, you can see the volume. 
Uh, but then there were a couple of sequences where there is just so much action. The camera's moving all around. Episode 106, if you haven't seen it, that one has the most 3D set builds um, because there's just so much action, so much moving camera. And so those were, we did have those uh, environments where they, we used the full 3D, but we had to look dev them so that they look like um, um, the actual 2D backgrounds. So we had our, our background painters use the same brushes to do all the texture work. And we worked with the look dev and the comp team to get those 3D backgrounds to look as close to 2D as possible. Hopefully we fooled you. Uh, that's the hope. Well, I, I also want to add, people will be asking, why didn't you use Unreal? Well, this show had to be done in a budget. So there is budgetary issues here. So um, yeah. that wasn't available to yeah. us because of budget. If you like, this is the poor man's version of <laughs> what we try <laughs> to do. Um, but again, yes, it, it, you know, you go to a studio, you work on these things, and this is a television show. This is not feature. You're always going to get hit with a budget and you're always going to get hit with some insane schedule. So this this was, you know, how Toby and I and the team sat together and go, OK, how do we make this with these parameters that are here? Um, and so I, I'm, I'm still quite in disbelief we pulled it off. <laughs> um, it was quite challenging. And also, you know, to create something that no one's ever seen before, to create a lane that isn't anime that or that isn't a Western, you know, Disney or a Pixar sort of DreamWorks, you know, type of animation. Those those mediums have its own lane. And in order to have the show live and succeed, I knew I had to create an avenue for ourselves. And I knew I had to create a show that no one's ever really seen before or experienced. So all these were at play and um, what we needed to consider as we build this. But let's go to our character. Yeah. Here we go. Segwaying to designing the cast. Mr. Brian Kessinger. Kessinger. Hello, Dean. Kessinger. hello, hello. Thanks, everyone. Uh, sorry, my internet all of a sudden started to just uh fail so let's see how this goes this will be fun let's go to the next slide awesome here she is we love her mizu is awesome uh so yeah with with the design in general we just wanted to match the level of sophistication that was present in the scripts so that really helped us point in a creative vision and direction um, where we could start making some choices because in animation it's all about choices and what you choose not to show. So I had the good fortune of working very closely with Jane uh, on these designs. I was on pretty early on, and uh, Jane had a vision uh, for these characters, for the look that she wanted, and we thought it best if we start with Mizu, um, because she's not only the main character uh, for the story, she's the main character for our design philosophy. So, um, we were inspired by a lot of the elongated forms and the elegance of the Benraku puppets. Uh, again, tying this all back to um, authenticity to the culture, right? Um, but because it is that blend, we also threw a little bit of Clint Eastwood swagger into it, right? To give her right. that kind of coolness. And um, one thing design-wise, um, she's a weapon. She's more weapon than a person at this point. So we gave her all sharp angles. So that was another choice. Um, and then just to wrap Mizu up in a, in a quick little package, uh, we worked with our, our vendor studio, Blue Spirit, to actually create a unique line art for this show. And that goes back to what Jane had envisioned and her love of Tech on Concrete, um, which I also really love. So we got to geek out about that together um, mm -hmm. and say, let's just draw it this way. And uh, Blue Spirit, worked really hard to get that line on there. So if we want to and, move on to, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, we, we can go to the next, yeah, we could stay on this slide, but I do want to mention something about Boom Rock with Puppets. So why Boom Rock with Puppets? It's because I used to watch that as a child with my aunt and I remember how those puppets um, haunted me because those are what, 300 year old 
puppetry art that Japan still still performs today. And they don't they're not puppets for kids. They they do full on adult stories about suicides and uh, and, uh, you know, like um, un unrequited love and really adult material. And I, I used to watch, I, I watched a lot of things as a kid when I should have watched, but I, I remember yeah. like, the, you know, I remember the movement of the puppets were so haunting and how they were designed was so haunting that this was a great opportunity to harken back to that. And again, using, using the cultural art as inspiration right exactly and it was so cool that we got to actually portray bunraku puppets in our show so that very was meta, a fun huh? kind of meta yeah very much yeah. so um but uh moving on to akemi i mean she's kind of the a, a great example of why the 2d animation aesthetic uh was so ripe for this show um that we could much like the Japanese dolls of the time and the puppets, there wasn't a lot of facial detail. It was very simplified and very smooth. Um, and so uh, we wanted to achieve that simplicity in 3D. But at the same time, because we were 3D, we could have really elaborate uh, textures and kimono patterns. Uh, and um, we really tell the story of the characters through their costume on this show. And I have to get a shout out. We actually had a costume designer on our show, uh, Sudarat Lalarb, uh, who comes from live action as well. And she was the fifth member of the character design team, uh, really upfront working with Jane um, to show us the importance, you know, because every, uh, almost everyone wore a kimono at that time, but that doesn't mean that they wore it all the same way. And Akemi is, you know, the utmost perfection uh, she is the princess, um, and so this was a great reason, uh, another good reason of why we went 2D, 3D uh, with the Kemi. And in fact, if we go to the next slide, we can talk about one of the other challenges on our show. And Jane, I'll let you go into this, but the idea that we were not a cloth sim show. Uh, I, I know we're all animation geeks here in the chat. So, uh, but in case you don't know, cloth sim is a phase in 3D animation where. Uh, you can have the computer help you kind of guide how the fabric should move. Um, we were not that. We were a rigged costume show. And right. uh, Jean, you want to talk about the kimonos and why that's impossible? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, a lot of you who are in animation went, "What are you crazy? Why would you design costumes like this on a rigged? Uh, yeah, you're right. I also knew that this was going to be crazy. This was going to be hard. So here's a couple of things that I, I was thinking that could get us out of it. First of all, um, there's only the sleeves to really move because if you are a woman of certain stature, you don't move very much. Once you sit, you sit. Once you stand, you stand. And a, ja a Japanese noble woman does not run. So, okay, so there shouldn't be things flying around. And also their hair are very quaffed and and shaped. So there shouldn't be too much hair to have, you know, to animate. But one of the one of the challenges we had was, um, for those of you that understand a kimono system, it's not a bathrobe. It is right. a series of layers that you wear, and the aesthetic of that time and of Asian Asian aesthetic is to look upholstered and to look perfectly with no wrinkles. Right, um, it's part of the culture. So this was to show them that the waistline is not an er in erogenous zone for Asians um, of this culture. It was, you know, back of the neck. It was the ankles. It was certain other things, um, and also to show them how the sleeve draped. So the the clown colors on on the left was to show them each pieces as they as they sat alone. And then um, the other ones were teaching them kind of how to build it so that the silhouette looked authentic. And mind you, I'm teaching, you know, Europeans about costumes that they otherwise feel, you know, don't really have a understanding for. So I had to fly to France many times with my suitcase full of kimonos 
and show them what it looked like, show them how heavy it was. Not every single kimono is made out of like skimpy silk. Um, some of them are damask, you know, jacquards and, and all sorts of things. And the, the, the uh, fabrics are actually quite heavy. Um, anything yeah, else to add? That's right. And uh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, just because we were in the pandemic and working all on Zoom doesn't mean that Jane still didn't get dressed up in full kimono <laughs> for us to do figure drawing remotely so that that's our right. character could get it right. And, you know, I think that's one of the special things I, I'm most proud of working on this show with this team is we got to highlight and specify details of this culture that otherwise get um, taken for granted or um, overlooked. You know, this was a chance to really show why details matter and why cultures Absolutely matter. Matters. So yeah, I, I learned so much and I appreciate Jane for allowing me to be a student and, and oh, learn and you're this a, stuff. So. You're a wonderful student. But, you know, oh. to add on to what Brian said, um, even, even how a lady walks in her kimono is a very, very specific movement. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had to teach that to everybody, um, you know, behaviors and such. Yeah, and these, these things, these cultural details are very, very important to me because if you know it, it, it is important. And um, I know that in my career, I was always told it's not important. Nobody will know, but I know. Mm. And if I know, you will know. Mm. Yeah, that's the great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great. Okay, so the next slide, uh, so Tygen. My, everyone's favorite uh, samurai, uh, Taigen. Uh, so he was designed a, a bit over the top, right? He he is the 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 peak of male samurai, even down to the uh, uh, quite prodigious uh, hair bun, which he doesn't have on screen for much. Uh, but um, he is the visual opposite of Mizu, right? So it was fun to kind of let her design dictate what his design should be. And, you know, I think that, you know, especially for all you Tygen X Mizu fans out there, I think that might be one of the reasons why he's attracted to her um, or in my brain, he's attracted to her uh, it, because she is who she wants to be and doesn't have to put on airs. Uh, and that's a lesson that he has to learn. And he literally, I mean, it's on the nose, but he lets his hair down. Uh, and that's the start of his journey of dis uh, discovery um, which he needs to go. He's, he's got a lot of growing still left to do. Uh, well, but I, also he was, think, I, I also think he has a, he has a talent. He has like a sword crush on her, right? He has like a oh, martial yeah. arts crush oh, on yeah. her. Yeah. Talent right, crush. Like, yeah. Talent crush. Yes. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Uh, for, who's next? Oh, yes. So I, I just wanted to point out, like, for for all these costume designs that you're seeing right here, like the color of his his green, um, the, these costumes were so specifically designed for these characters. Green yeah. at this point was um, a, sig a signifier of youth. And so that's why um, Suderet Lalarbe assigned this color to, to Tygen. And then next we have our favorite, Ringo. Our favorite, Ringo. Our round and lovable, softly shaped Ringo. Uh, in in a world of of swords and weapons, he he gets to be the 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 noodle bowl, right? So That's um, right, the heart, we leaned yeah. into that. Yeah, exactly. Um, this was an important character too because um, he's got a very visible disability, right? Uh, and we wanted to show, and this was coming from the showrunners themselves too. Uh, a respectful portrayal of someone with limb difference, right? And yeah. uh, we didn't want to make him, although he lends himself to humorous moments and he's a lighter element to the show, he's not the butt of any jokes, right? right. We see he's him the mistreated. Heart of all the joke. That's right. He's the heart, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And so our um, showrunner, Michael Green, uh, tells a story. He knew someone in college who had this same... Uh, uh, deal with uh, being born without hands and that he used his wristwatch. He had two wristwatches, one on each arm. 
And that's why you use to put tools in to help him manipulate objects. And so Michael has a tribute uh, to that friend uh, included that detail. So that's why Ringo is still so proficient and he wants to be great. I think he already is, uh, but he was a very fun character to design. Uh, if we go on to uh, the next one, which is uh, one of my favorites, Swordfather, right? And so, so this is a good opportunity to talk about just the practical side of things. Um, our budget um, didn't allow us to design every single character to the same level of fidelity, right? We had to categorize, and that was one of my jobs coming on early, was to look at these scripts with over 150 talking characters and figure out how we can do it on a TV budget. Uh, and uh, working again with the vendor studio, we came up with categories. And Swordfather here was one of our hero categories, meaning we could design everything from scratch, even the teeth. So um, right. this is a, you know, you'll see certain characters throughout the show, especially on rewatches, um, you'll see uh, where we had to reuse. But we can go on to Seki. Uh, and Seki is another, he's great, uh, such good voice acting too. Um, and this too is an example of how uh, this is a second tier character. So um, the only thing new and original on Seki here, and we're getting into the weeds, but I figure this is the stuff you guys want to know, um, is his head. We spent all the time designing a unique and very specific head for performance. Um, and we were able to do so by reusing parts. So you're going to see Heiji Shindo later, and I'll point out uh, where we reuse some of that. Uh, but moving on to, um, oh, this guy. Yeah, Fowler. Everyone's he's a beast. Favorite. Yep, yep. He's an amazing villain, and uh, he's huge. He's imposing. Uh, we purposefully went uh, a little broader with his design to contrast the uh, more reserved nature of the Japanese characters of our show, right? He, he is the ugly foreigner coming in, being totally disrespectful. So you can see in his mouth charts there, we went really broad with his range of movements um, just to contrast and to show his kind of villainous difference, even on a subtle performance level like that. Um, and uh, while we're talking about villains, uh, we also have... Mr. Heiji Shindo here, um, uh, while he still had both arms, uh, which is nice. But um, but yeah, you can see, if you look, it's the same body, hands, feet as uh, Seki, uh, but a completely uh, unique head for uh, performance, which is really good. And then we're able to adjust our kimono patterns, our colors, that sort of thing uh, was a way for us to get around that little bit of a of a hurdle um, with with him. But it, it's fun to talk about that middle picture there, which is more of like the head and shoulders uh, shot of him. Those would typically be the first type of drawings I would do for a character. Because our showrunners came from live action, Jane and I would treat the um, early design discussions almost as casting sessions. So we That's would right. pre present headshots, right? And we would give headshots because we knew that there would be a lot of dialogue, a lot of emotion right. playing on these faces. And so right. that's how we kind of guided our characters. Right. And while also giving each character a, a different enough shapes in their head so that they can perform yes. and you can recognize who they were and, and they, they were interesting to look at. Yeah, perfectly said. Because for our last character here, we're going to talk about is Madame Kaji. Um, and, you know, you have characters in this show who are wearing the same clothes, who have very similar hairstyles. So how do you make them different? And the wedge of design for our show was razor thin. We we had a very specific channel we were working in. So for Madame Kaji, we did things like elongate her a little bit more. So if you think of Akemi's face as a circle, uh, Madame Kaji's is a, is a oval. Right, so we elongate. Even her hair is stretched uh, more than Akemi's. Um, and uh, shout out to the beautiful kimono, one of my favorite kimonos in the show, designed by Abigail Larson, one of our uh, amazing character designers who also doubled as our kimono pattern uh, yeah. uh, generator. <clears throat> so 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's a little bit about characters. So the next thing we want to get into is um, a typical life of a shot that we would go through. So what you're going to see first is typically like a um, storyboard. In a storyboard like this, we would have gone and done the scouting already. We 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 would already lens it up and we would know what um, how how far the background is and and what it would look like on screen. So we would draw it, and then it would be sent to. This is. Yes, this is a layout from um, from Blue Spirit. And as you notice, we make sure that they have all of our lenses on there properly. And then it would go into animation. And once it goes in, this is a rough animation. The lighting's not really there. And then it then Toby would do his notes all right, over so, it. <laughs> <laughs> well. So we get animation. We also get a glimpse at layout. So this is our first. So we did, we did our three D layout, and then like I mentioned, with our two and a half D approach, now our background paint department has taken that layout to do the the, the plates. They've started painting. Matte painting, yeah. And this is yeah, and the set extension and the matte painting. And this is where the majesty of the shot kind of fell short. And so that's where. You know, we look at okay, what was the tonal intent? What what is the storytelling and the mood? So then we take this, and then this is where a lot of that uh, back and forth in shot production happens. And that's taking okay, well here's where we are on left. We're not completely reinventing the shot. We're just taking here's what you have, and then here's where we were wanting it to go. And so we do these paint overs, hundreds of paint overs over the course of the 360 minutes of footage that we produced. So that way we can tell them the intent, like we need to do this, we need to do that. Let's get this, let's get the sun over here. So it's just this awe inspiring, this is the biggest city Mizu's ever seen in her entire life. And it has to be, it just has to take her breath away. And then we end up with our final light, lit and composited shot. And so that is the making of Blue Eye Samurai. And we would love to take uh, questions right now. So um, is anybody, Chris, are you moderating the questions? Thank you. Yes. Boy, are there, are there a lot of them. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to try and get through them. Uh, a couple of a quick notes that I wanted to, uh, just say as an aside thank you all for that that was amazing that was extremely insightful um i know i know you all talked about just respecting a lot of of the tradition and stuff and really really paying attention i have to tell you one of my biggest pet peeves is the direction of which you fold a kimono a lot of people get that wrong and it's one of the things that i think a lot of people they just don't think about you just we're just gonna you're just gonna put it on however you put it on. They just hold it, no, you know. You can't, um, you can't. No, and there's have, a lot of stuff tried, like that. Also, trying to trying to fold a hakama, you know how hard that is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all all of that stuff. There's again, I, I shout out Little Tokyo a lot, but uh again by the Aratani Theater, if you're ever in town and you want to check out a kimono, there's a wonderful bachan that uh will help you out rent. And she does it all for you. Smells a little bit like cigarettes, but you know, you take it as it comes. You take it as it comes, and uh, and it's okay. So so shout out, please support small businesses and keep Little Tokyo alive. Okay, that being said, <laughs> um, got a lot of questions. The number one question that I'm going to ask in chat, you can thank me later. When's the art book, y'all? When, when's it coming out? Everybody's everybody's clamoring for it. I mean, if anything, is there an art book coming out? What's the deal with it? What's what's happening? Any insight uh, on think, that? I think that's a Netflix question. So we don't know. I mean, we have we're ready. So we just need yeah. a we just need a go. We've right, got right, to your right to your senators, right to your Congress people. That's right. Let them know you need the art book. Yeah. All right, chat. So if you take anything away from this, take away that uh, the team of Blue Eye Samurai is amazing. Uh, no one's a cool place. And make sure to hit up Netflix for an art book. All right. By the way, the only <clears> reason <throat> why we got a second season was because all of you guys asked for it. So if you want an art book, ask for it. See? See? Okay. So 
We're going into a lot of these questions. Again, chat, I'm going to try and get through as many of them as we can. Luckily, I'll breeze through. It's talking about season two. Uh, will you be using the same animation team for season two? Can you talk a little bit about season two, or are you kind of like behind lock and key right now? We're behind lock and keys. Okay. We're, we're, so, we're, barely, we're just starting out, so we, we're trying to settle a lot of things right now, so we can't talk about okay. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, then, <laughs> then going into the next thing for each of you, well, I guess, uh, this is just kind of like your favorite character from the show. And I know it's like choosing one of your children's and you're not supposed to do that. Uh, but Ma, we all know how you feel about me. I love you too. <laughs> uh, so sometimes you just gotta, you gotta pick your favorites y'all. You gonna kick us off, Jane? Yeah. I think my favorite character has to be Thor Father. Um, he, I wanted to make sure that that grumpy old Asian man really comes through because there's a very, there's a specificity to it. You know, like the way he squats, the way he groans, the way he just kind of tilts his head and things like that. I, I really wanted to, to get that across. And I think, you know, um, unless... I think unless you've grown up with a cranky old Asian man, it's kind of it's kind of hard to do. So he's my favorite. I thought he came he came out really good. Toby, I, 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 <laughs> mine was Sword Father too, for all the reasons that you said. Like he he's great. I can totally smell the cigarettes on him. That's right. Just by looking at him. Emil, what about you? I'm actually torn between uh, uh, Akemi and uh, uh, Tygen. Obviously, Mizu ah. is the main character and I love her so much. But in terms of intriguing, uh, these two characters are very intriguing to me. Uh, Akemi, because she has a, a, a goal, an agenda, and she's smart and manipulative. And Tygen is uh, the guy that also is pedaling to get somewhere that he doesn't even know where. Because he's got everything and she's got everything. And they really want to go further than they are. So anyway, that's the thing. Yeah, that's James, These are my you? Well, you guys have covered all the main characters and I, I love them all. I, I think the strength as well in the show was the secondary characters. You know, Madam Kaji was beautiful design, beautifully portrayed, and a great bridge between the goodies and the baddies. And and but then I think for that Seki and not Seki Shindo was an amazing uh, bad guy because he was slimy. He was he was snake like, and he and it was so it was one of the characters that was really hard to see him go. Yeah. It was great to see his arm cut off and his arm wriggling around and his arm being shot by an arrow even. It was like, yeah. But to see him go was like you wanted to liked him, him yeah. to continue to be that that bridge between good and evil and not Randall. Yeah. What about you, Brian? What was your favorite? Uh Mizu. Mizu a hundred percent. She's she's the best. I, I love her. She's so complicated. And she's got a lot of growing to do. And um, yeah, she's awesome. There's, there's a little Mizu in all of us, isn't there? I think so. I yeah. Think oh, yeah. So. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's definitely, um, there was a huge disconnect for me growing up of just kind of like belonging in two worlds, but then simultaneously belonging in no worlds. Yep. Um, and I really, really got that from that character, which uh hit a little too close to home at first <laughs> yeah, um yeah you're talking about like me on a daily basis too so yeah I yeah i mean yeah and, and, I, and i know that there's a lot of people in chat obviously you know that can that can uh, live with this i i actually have a, a question as well uh so the the antithesis of mizu in a lot of ways is is um you know uh, the 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 person she sails off in the boat with at the end However, we have uh, Kaji, uh, so we have fire and we have water. What, what was kind of the, the idea of like the naming process there versus making the antagonist the Kaji 
instead you made this i guess this geisha uh the 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 opposite of mizu which is water or is it not that deep it's just mizu because her eyes are blue it yeah it was just mizu because her eyes were blue um but i think there could be more to that because you know be like water uh water water is soft and it's hard and it's violent and it's gentle so it's it's got the duality that that character expresses itself you know oh that's love a bruce lee reference yeah very yeah. good and episode five really encapsulates the the flexibility that's exactly, of that's exactly what we did it was um inner the dragon kind of mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so the other thing that a lot of people are asking about is if there's any more insight that you can provide on the line work. So you had mentioned Tech on Creek. For some people, you may know that film is black and white, um, but can you kind of dive a little bit more on the technical aspect of the line work and, and what, what kind of big hurdles did you have to kind of overcome, if at all? All right, well, that goes to Toby and Brian. I don't, I, I don't do technical. <laughs> you want to get into the 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 line and i can get into the how we did it yeah that sounds great that sounds great so yeah if you think of this um this process is sometimes referred to um a tune shaded look or a self shaded look and basically what that's doing is it's a shader um that you render your characters with that um, will purposefully flatten them out and kind of transpose an outline um, around the edges, right? And it's getting pretty good. The early days, I remember when they first started doing them, it was a little rough around the edges, uh, but it's getting really good. Um, and a lot of shows are using it, um, but it can sometimes be a little overbearing, the line itself, can be a little thick and we again we wanted we were striving for like an elegance to our designs and 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 a fluidity um and uh so uh i worked with blue spirit i actually literally would send them my drawings in this thin line art style like a micron pen like a 0.5 micron pen style drawing and they would work on getting their shaders to mimic that line. But then on top of that, it wasn't about having one consistent line the whole time. Jane and I really liked the rough animation uh, in the 70s of Disney, like Robin Hood and Jungle Book, where you could see the rough animators lines kind of finding the shapes. So if you watch the show uh, again and look at the line art itself, it's actually moving around. It's crawling, what we call it. Uh, and uh, it, it's a specific look to give a warmth and and uh, uh, solidity to the to the look. Yeah, and we spent a lot of time look diving that you know in order to get that to to work. See it move on moving characters while they're acting and, and in held shots just to see how that looks to avoid things like aliasing and and some more. A. So. Uh, without getting into the secret sauce and, and the the secret ingredient, but to like what Brian was talking about using the shaders, we were um, detecting you know uh, silhouette edges. So you get your silhouette edge uh, line. Then we also were detecting things like change in topology. So wherever there was, I saw in the chat, you know, how did you get the chisel look on the characters? So where some of those chisels were modeled into the characters. It was an intentional to help us draw a line there sometimes. And then if we weren't able to draw the line there, then we would use uh, geometry, which we didn't render in order to get the line to show up. So things like the line on the hair, you know, we would, there is geometry there that we were using just to draw the line. And then we just don't render the, that geometry. Um, and then, we, you know, we had control over line color you know, do, using the different UVs and UDIMs and stuff. So, but uh, there you go. A, a, a little bit of nerd talk without the secret sauce. Is that okay? Is that okay? Hopefully that's enough. <laughs> it, it, was, yeah. it, it was great. It didn't melt my brain. Okay, good. Because usually guys start getting technical and they start 
talking like techie like that, my brain just feels like it's melting. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so we'll, go, yeah. we'll go tech and then we'll go a little bit uh, a lighter question. Um, I, I guess I'll open this up to everyone. Uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in if uh, Mizu was in current time. Uh, a lot of people are asking a lot of like current Mizu stuff. So as the the uh, parents of, of Mizu, I guess we could say, um, if Mizu were alive today here with all of us, what kind of music do you think that she would listen to? <laughs> ah. Toby? I know it's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. I know everyone's thinking now like, oh gosh. Toby, Rammstein. Toby Toby's our, <laughs> our in-house DJ. He he uh, soundtracked a lot of our work time. Oh yeah, you you gotta you gotta have a good good playlist when you're working for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think she listens to uh, baby metal. I was gonna say I think she seems like a metal gal to me. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, give me chocolate. Um, <laughs> So uh, you talk a lot about your 2.5D, and um, a lot of people are curious how you decide at which points you have that mix, have that blend, and at which points you're kind of just going full 3D here. It, it, was, really, it, it was really dependent on what the camera does. Mm -hmm. um, we design our camera in, in our previous storyboard first, and depending on what that is, that kicks it back to the art department for them to figure out which is the best, uh, what what is the best practice. And also Blue Spirit then also jumps in and says, whoa, that's way too hard. Can we do it this way? You know, so there's a lot of partnership between our overseas studios and us and how we produce this. Hmm. Yeah. Toby uh, touched on it earlier when he was saying like, the challenge was to make that seamless between the 3D and the 2D so the 2.5 is like you tell where they meet yeah indeed so in that same technical vein do you how did the motion cap was there any motion capture process or was there a lot of just watching and then seeing like oh this yeah, is that, that's a that's a good um segue to talk about action so mm. in live action what we tend to do is shoot out all the the, the live action choreography with a stunt team and stunt performers right so that's what we would do at, at marvel and all these big places um and check to see if that works in camera so instead of having board artists having to slave away at drawing those and creating those choreography um i had the stunt team do it and also me being a martial artist i didn't want made up martial arts i wanted the martial arts to have just as much authenticity in it as you would see the the you know the culture and everything else and so that also alleviated a board artist who was not a martial artist to try to look up what that meant or how to do that because this is on a tv schedule you you gotta you gotta turn this in in three weeks and there's just no way in hell you're gonna have that kind of choreography and be able to put all that together in three weeks so we just cut in the actual stunt viz material and um we did the oldest trick in the book and what Disney used to do, which was rotoscope. Interesting yeah. is, yeah. yeah. No ping pong balls. No. <laughs> no. No ping pong balls. So then for those who don't know, can you explain that process a little bit of rotoscope? So our rotoscoping is um, a slightly different. So rotoscope back in, you know, you guys have all seen Disney uh, when they hire an actress to play Tinkerbell and she would just do those movements. And then an, an animator would look at that reference material and draw from that reference material for the timing and, and all that stuff. So our stunt viz is sort of the same thing, except in our stunt viz material, all you would see are just walls and boxes and maybe directions of which way the camera is pointing. So with that material, we had to give it to our previous team and our previous then had to put the environment in right and in, into what those shots are so that the overseas studios the layout team knew 
where the cameras were and then how fast the, the cameras were moving, all the, all the previs tech, um, tech vis material. Once that's done, the animators would really have to look at the stunt team and their, their body performances to give them the, the visual reference to animate. And of course, um, that also meant I had to fly to France many times with my foam sword and teach them, you know, try to teach them just, just basics of martial arts. Because if you don't know how to throw a punch and if you don't know how the body moves, you're not going to understand where the weight's going to, where, where the weight needs to be. So and also a, there's such a big difference between uh, the fighting style of a, of a samurai and and all, I mean, between all fighting styles, but especially with weapons, right? Um, well, yeah, we, we wanted to be really true to Bushido, right? But the thing is, if you're really good with a katana, you should be able to cut down somebody in two, two swipes, but that makes for a really boring show, right? So, you know, we did elaborate a little bit more, but also because we, you know, knew martial arts, we, we kind of knew how much to push it and not push it before it got too much into the Chinese wushu fighting style or, you know, American um, boxing style and so forth. So we just kind of knew where those lines were. But, you know, one thing that was really great about her is that because she's self-taught, we didn't have to be as formal as, say, a Taigen would. So if you go back and you watch it again, Mizu's never standing straight up. She's never holding her sword right. She never has the right footing, you know? The attention to detail is is monumental. So then we run into using 3D Studio Max, right? Running into a lot of these kind of uh, uh, hurdles. How do you do you do you think within the scale of what you have, or do you think big, try and accomplish it, and then scale it back? Like how how does that kind of work? This is going to blow your brain. We do all that at the same time. <laughs> Okay. Okay. It did blow my brain. So go ahead and go ahead and try and pick up the pieces a little bit if you could. So all of it is happening simultaneously. So what, what, what this, that's, this, this is why, this is why the team that we have is, is why I call them Navy SEALs because you have to have the years of experience doing what you're doing. And when, when the assignment is launched, you go, you, you're already doing the calculation. You go, no, can't do that. Yep. Yeah, we got into that. And so at the end of the day, we make a team decision and that's the decision we went for because there was no time to iterate. There was no time to explore. Imagine an archer that's letting go a, an, uh, an arrow and it's got to hit the bullseye every, every, every time you let loose, it's got to hit the bullseye because mm -hmm. once you miss it, that's two more weeks that we have to put into the schedule that we don't have. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to do it all at the same time. And Chris, I mean, like you were asking, do you think about your limitations? Obviously, like I mentioned earlier, we don't have the $250 million to make 3D look 2D. So that's why, well, then let's just paint these backgrounds. It's going to be, it's, you know, because then it will look 2D. And we know that our characters, you know, Jane was always targeting this more stylized 2D look. And again, we just made sure that it worked with with our inspiration, with the ukiyo-e style. So it it worked uh, tonally for the show. And then we also found ways to then make that work for uh, the, the, the budget and the schedule. And yeah, you kind of do the best you can with the cards you're dealt. But we tried not to let that limit the story, right? It's like, what does the story need? And then Correct. we always try to shoot for that, get uh, like story to king, story drives. And I do want to mention what's also special about our show is that I hired a live action director to direct on one of our episode because I wanted to see how mixing the medium and the, the, the people that work on it, what the outcome would be. So um, I got to hire Alan Taylor, who directed a lot of the Game of Thrones to come direct on our show. And uh, he directed 107. And I thought that came out so elegantly. And he put the cameras there in, in certain places that I would have never thought of 
you know, so uh, that was wonderful. Yeah, that's that's really insightful because again, the the the, the show feels like it's it's one of those things where you're all talking about it in retrospect of all of these things that you wanted to accomplish, but then there's everybody here watching or watching this in the chat, and then myself that when I was watching it, it was like, oh, they, they just wanted to do that stuff. There were no difficulties. Like there it is. It, it just looks exactly like you wanted it. Like it was easy. And, and, and to, talking to y'all now, I mean, it, it just seems like you had to have Navy SEALs in order to accomplish it, especially it, with, it with the limitation very, that you had. It was, it was a very difficult four years. Um, I know that we set the bar very, very high for ourselves, but that's also the reason why we all wanted to work on this show to to do something new to really push the envelope and and ask how we can how we can set the bar a little bit higher and um you know there there were a lot of difficult days but these guys kept me laughing these guys kept me you know looking forward to work and seeing my friends that helps mm -hmm. and toby's dad jokes they help <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh has got some great dad jokes. Um, oh boy! So <laughs> we do also have a lot of questions about uh, the fangs and the inspiration behind them, and kind of where that idea came from, and a little bit of that character creation. Is is there any insight you can give us, kind of on on, on that crew? Brian, you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. There's a fun detail. Um, you said the, the fangs, right? The four fangs? Yeah. Um, there's a fun detail we did with them that some people have caught and I've seen comment on is that we gave them, uh, we gave them a Chinese Tao sword. Uh, we gave them some Thai weapons um, just to show, and again, everything's storytelling uh, on every level. And the story we wanted to tell with these were that these were mercenaries that have traveled the land uh, and they're nefarious, and they've they've killed abroad and taken the weapons and spoils of war, and so that was kind of a fun thing to play, just outside of Japanese culture for a moment, and look at weaponry from other Asian influences. So that that was cool, and then of course their their um, masks uh, were were so fun to design. I love I love those masks, and um, Chiaki. The leader was very much our Darth Vader, right? So that was really fun to kind of get some of that imposing silhouette uh, in there. Very cool. So then someone's asking a more practical question of the managing and working with a foreign studio, even though it's a small part of the show, how do you manage like the jet lag for the daily uh, schedule? Like how does that all look like working with uh, a it, it was a huge part of it. Um, we basically almost had meetings with them every morning, starting at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and then most of the mornings were communicating with the, the French studios. And then we broke our ways and then we did our assignments and we would upload information to them so that they would get it by their morning and we're in bed. Um, and then it was just me and a couple of production people and, and Toby, you and I, went over there a couple of times to mm -hmm. help them along. But yes, there was a lot of traveling for me. There was a lot of, um, we learned French really fast. <laughs> <laughs> and we, it, it works well, right? Because it means somebody somewhere on the globe is awake and working. You know what I mean? Because we, even on on uh, pre-production, we had, we had some artists in Asia, we had artists in Canada, we had artists in Europe. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the things, like Jane said, hey, lockdown, let's make this work. So, And then uh, the software that you use to model and animate the characters. We know the world was, was 3D Studio Max. Was, was it all, was all the same? Yeah. All in there. Everyone's still, at, every, that question is, is still populating pretty consistently right now. I think no one wants to believe it. So they're just still asking because they're just like, okay, tell us the truth. Like, really? Come on. Yeah. But, but you know what's interesting about our show is nothing. Go ahead. Go ahead, Emil. No, I just wanted to add that uh, 
Blue Spirit was uh, using 3D Max, but we were all designing and working in Maya. And they were yeah. getting our files there and transforming it into, into Max. Thank you for that. That's a good good thing to bring up. We were working Maya stateside. They were working 3D Max. So. So then uh, we have a, a question from Holly from someone with a disability. Was there a reason behind making Ringo disabled? And it means so much to see a visibility disabled character uh, portrayed so realistically. So they just wanted to say thank you. But also just kind of the idea behind the, the character. I the idea you know really came from michael and amber the creators and the writers and our executive producers on the show and like toby had mentioned uh michael had experienced a, a friend of his or, or or our colleague that he knew back from college where where that was that was his disability but what he came across was that he didn't let that disability change his lifestyle or anything he did everything um, anyone was able to do and did it very efficiently. So I, you know, that had always stuck with him. R Ringo's disability is, is obvious. Mizu's disability is a little bit more inward. And so that was just kind of a great dichotomy to show um, because Ringo is what is missing in Mizu and vice versa, you know? So we, you talk a lot about, uh, all the things that you know you wanted to achieve and and how amazing your team was along the way and everything that you all executed there are a few questions of being held back realistic constraints uh cost timeline obviously you know there's the there's the cost and you mentioned not being able to use unreal and stuff but what are some other kind of uh re issues that, that you ran into hurdles that you kind of had to keep hammering in, until something gave well, um, I am so happy none of you guys noticed it, but there, to me, there, there was a lot of animation stuff that we couldn't go back to call retakes on because of budgetary and schedule issues. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times when the group, when this group got, got together and looked at footage, we have to say, is it good enough? And I hate doing that. I don't mm. like saying, is it good enough? But that is practical side of our business and um i'm glad no one really noticed Oof. i think time was the, the essence on the show it was um it was important like jane said to hit that bullseye every time we could with the art department and um luckily uh, I think we were successful because we planned in advance hmm. and uh you know, like whenever there was an opportunity to, to try and find the best way to design something or to work in something that, would, something that would visually support the story, that's when we had to really like go with our gut instincts. And I think that's where the experience comes in. Over time, you start to develop this like sense and right. sometimes you just dismiss it when you're an artist. But other times you go like, no, we've, we've, got to, we've got to just trust. And I think that's what the support from Jane and Toby you know, we, Emil and I were just like running, you know, ahead trying to support what um, the showrunners and Jane were setting up. So that was it. Time was, you know, money is is important, and um, other things are important to animation. But having the time to think, that was one of the that was um, one of the things that we were acutely aware of all the way through the show. Yeah, if we had more time, even more thought would have been put in. Because uh, I'm with I'm with James. You know, I'm used to the feature kind of timetables. This was my first stint in series work, and so uh, that took some getting used to. It's it's a it's a very very uh, cold shower when you start working on that waterfall hits, and then you're hit with that waterfall, and you're like, oh my god, we gotta keep moving. Um, but yeah, you, you, you do like, like I mentioned before, stories King and we had awesome, we had an awesome team. And so we read those scripts, we all knew what it needed to be. So it helps inform you prioritize and make the right decisions on what's best for the story. Right. And I think a lot of it was also knowing how to do research. I mean, we didn't Google anything and go, well, here it is. That's what Google said. I mean, we backed our research 
two or three backups. And if we couldn't get the research backed up, we just didn't use it because that's not, that's not how we wanted to represent, you know? So yeah. have, having the right research helps you make the show. Yeah. I mean, one of, uh, one of the key things that we, we had to do is because as everybody said so far, we had no budget and uh, just in, in arithmetics, we had 360 minutes of, of content, uh, which is basically four feature films. And we had to do it within what, I mean, I was on the show for two years and uh, some people were more. But anyway, my point was that because we had no time for experiments, uh, we had to do a lot of prep work, basically not only designing it, but also uh, preparing every uh, uh, things that we thought, uh, we knew was going to happen. We, we, we had a kit for nature, for example, or a kit for hills and mountains, you know, these hills that are on the back. I mean, basically, we designed them and prepped them. And of course, they were uh, using them, but also, they're also they had a, 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 some room to interpret it as well it's not just copy and paste mm -hmm. and uh, uh you know the clouds are also designed and they simply uh, uh were using a lot of them but a lot of them were just inspirational for them as well so we had to prep all these things so everything goes smoothly within the time frame that we had hmm. kind of like the well, warrior the warrior response like uh the samurai uh, ethos is we made what we had were dealt our strength and so i think it shows in the profile of, of the show you know those limitations we we turned them and, and made sure that it didn't affect the storytelling so speaking of uh everything that you all had to do to uh, accomplish everything and, and again we talk about the, the minimal budget and, and all those stuff looking back on it is there anything that you would have done differently this is a question that has been been coming up a lot and, and i know that you know get more money would probably be the great thing to, to say <laughs> um, but other than that is there something that you look at or is it one of these situations where I mean, you know, the product, the, the, the proof is in the pudding and, and, and what it is, is what it's supposed to be. And, and to change it was almost to kind of mess with it. Well, where, where, where do you stand on? I, I would do, re oh, go for it, Jane. No, no, I want to hear what you're going to say. I was going to say, I'd redo the horses. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have much of a, a budget or time for animals uh, in oh, our yeah. show. Yeah. And, uh, the horses were kind of an in joke for all of us because they just had to be what they were, and uh, um, yeah. So selfishly, uh, I would uh, and I would have killed to have a couple water buffalo in like a dog. long shot or something. A dog, like that. Dog. A dog, dog, dog running through the city. Yeah. So season two, here's hoping. We'll yes, I am um, our dog. Um, yes, yeah, season two, there's going to be an episode in a zoo, is what you're telling yes, me. Yes, yes. It's all, it's all zoo, zoo. Right. I, I, think, <laughs> I think for me personally, this show was such a huge experiment, and I had so much support from, you know, the, the showrunners and from Netflix and from all the team. I think I got to do everything I wanted to do on this show. I wish we had more time to refine it a little bit more. So that's what I would like to do in season two is just refine because yeah. season one was the prototype, you know? Yeah, that was going to be my answer. Everything that we wanted to do differently because we're turning that crank on the season two, we're trying to do it differently on season two, do it better. So stay to tuned. Add, to add on to that um, as well, I think it's a complicated question in animation, you know, what would you do better? If if we had done it any other way, I th I'm pretty sure the show would never have been made. And and I think the experiment was that it became what it was because of how we, you know, pushed forward. And there were many things that we, in hindsight, 
we would like to redo like horses and buffalo. <laughs> Both horses. <laughs> but um, the the many things that can stop animation from hitting the screen. It's it's uh, phenomenal. It's amazing that these things get made. It's like launching Apollo or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody that. remembers Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew when we had our first, um, was it our first 90 seconds or 60 seconds of footage come back? Mm -hmm. Our first footage that came back. When it came back, I just had a sigh of relief. I, I knew this was going to be fine. And I um, got the production to, to hold off um, one of our big theaters at Netflix. And I, I had all of our executives come. I had all of our team come to just watch the 60 second footage. <laughs> Because I I knew this was this was something no one's ever seen before and um, it it played so well and I think that's also why Netflix uh, supported us wholeheartedly after seeing that. Just just as a, a quick aside, the the entire chat is is saying that Mizu needs to pet a dog in season two. So if okay. if we do end up seeing that chat, just just know that you made it happen along okay. with the art book. <laughs> Make the notes now. Um, so for Brian, and I think also for Jane, because uh, you were talking about how you you both kind of worked in tandem on Mizu's design. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about Mizu's design? And uh, Emily called out that they were very impressed by her blend of masculine and feminine and how she looked so, quote, unquote, unnatural in traditional makeup, I'm assuming. Uh, in, in I think it's episode five when, when we see her in more traditional makeup. So any more insight you can give kind of on your your teamwork there? I can start off and then punt it to you, Brian. But I know that when Brian came on, we were in the beginning of it. And I knew that these characters had to live in close-ups, right? But in animation, we, we do it a little bit differently through shapes. And so the first thing I assigned Brian to do was to look for make sure that all of our main characters had different shaped eyes so that when we pull into a close-up you, you know exactly who you're looking at right away so it's not like an anime eye where you know the eyes are kind of all the same but every main character should have a specially shaped eye and so brian go ahead tell them how you, where you went with that well yeah and then it just became the collaboration of like uh hot and cold Right. We would do so many drawings. There's so many like versions of Mizu where she looked too feminine or she looked too masculine. And, it, you know, we just honed in. And what I loved, you know, even though we were working separately, it was still the fundamental of like taking a piece of paper over someone's drawing and drawing on top of. There was so much of that going on so that she kind of developed as a, as a Polaroid in front of our eyes and uh, all because of our inputs. And I think that that was the true test uh, when we did see her in episode five and it's jarring to see her with her hair up. Uh, That's like, okay, cool. We did, we did something right. Um, and there's a fun little detail uh, with that look in particular is we purposefully made all her kimonos uh, short. Um, so you see a little bit more of her like leg to top of ta tabby sock uh, uh, because she's just so tall and she doesn't fit. Even when she's trying to fit into the mold, she doesn't fit. So the sleeves of her kimono are short uh, and the hemline is as well. So um, yeah, it was fun to see. And uh, episode five is my favorite episode. And like, so to see the creation of the monster, you know, how heartbreaking that was and to see her trying to fit in and, and cause that's also the episode where we see her in her most feminine when she has her hair down, when she really falls for Mikio. And we did some subtle stuff there too, where we actually, for those shots, took away the lines under her eyes. So she has no bags under her eyes like she does the rest of the show. And we actually put some color into her cheeks. So in those few fleeting shots, she's her most feminine self. And then after the betrayal, she becomes the Unreal, the monster. Yeah, that was a 
that was a heavy episode to to watch. I think I think you can see, you know, I, again as as I was talking about before, you can really see yourself in that if you if you kind of um, you know are, are kind of balancing between you know being what people want you to be and trying to find yourself within it. Um, but I think in it being difficult to watch is what made it so good and so impactful. And I'm glad you said that because I also, one of the things I wanted to to, to really <clears throat> set to do was to show that animation can tell these really deep and complex stories, right? <laughs> and when we say that this is not for children, we're not just talking about, you know, the sex and the violence. We're talking about like how complex these characters are and how heartbreaking. These are, these are concepts that I think children may not understand yet. You know, this betrayal and heartbreak, but we uh, as adults know it. So it's just to also prove that we can do mature content hmm. on something because in Asia, we do adult content with animation all day and it's normal. And in the West, we don't do it. And I don't understand why. So hmm. this was just a really great opportunity to say, see, you can do it. And I'm hoping that this opens up a whole new genre and avenue for animation, you know? And, and I, I bring this movie up a lot. And uh, I was talking about my bacha and my grandmother earlier. And to your point, I was, I don't know, 10 when she showed me Grave of the Fireflies. And oh I was God. like, oh, it's an animated movie. I'm going to love it. <laughs> and, and then it just went downhill. I think I, yeah, I think the intro was the best part when I was 10. And then it just was a speed <laughs> Yeah, I, right I was, I didn't even know what that was. And I was watching mm -hmm. it and I was in tears after that. And anytime mm -hmm. I hear a tin can shaking candy uh, thing, that ruins me. I can't do it. You know, they changed the packaging. The, the packaging used to be like a certain way. Now I was in the store recently. Uh, shout out to 99 Ranch. Um, and they have uh, like uh, anime characters on it now. They make it happy. It's not happy. You're not fooling anybody, hard candy <laughs> tin. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> that was some trauma that was coming out there. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> somebody was actually curious about the storyboarding process and uh, the director, writer, uh, storyboarding artist working together. How does that all kind of look? How does that communication go? <laughs> oh, I guess that's it. <laughs> um, my job as a supervising director was just to make sure that the directors um, had support and they knew, and also me, you know, me being the cultural police, you know, they, they had support in, in telling this culturally sensitive story. But um, the directors worked closely with the storyboard artists to, you know, direct them to what they need. My job was to make sure that also previs came in to do the scout to make sure that they had the set, they had all the materials that they needed to do that. Um, I would supplement some of the storyboards sometimes like after it's drawn right if there was some some little stunt there that had to be done i would take the team and we would do reference shoot um in at netflix or in my backyard just to help out with some of the movements um because you know storyboard and also we had to storyboard so fast we we couldn't be as detailed as we wanted, so we had to supplement quite a bit with some of our visual references. But um, generally, we're, we're always we always launch our sequences to make sure that everybody understands the story. We had enough time for Q and A. Um, I I basically just kind of was the mom and made sure like, did you eat? Did you have this reference material? What do you need? And I make I just let the directors. Um, work with the storyboard artist closely. So then in, in the developing, in everything, seeing it from A to Z, which episode was the most technically difficult to execute? I saw you, Lee, I saw you put it again. I'm asking them the question, which, so which one is for you, maybe it's a personal decision, but as a group, maybe you all agree, which was the most difficult to, to work through? Six. This was six? Yeah, I think it was six. My, mine was eight. We had to build the entire city, the entire palace, and we had to burn it all down and have an army march through it. So 
मानो जी इट्स अ इट्स अ हार्ड हार्ड कॉल बिकॉज़ अम इट वाज एक्सटेंसिव एंड वी ऑल न्यू वी गोना फिनिश विद अ बैंग बट या नंबर 6 वाज वेरी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड बिकॉज़ वी हैड द 3 डी बिल्ड 2D, we're we're marrying them together as hybrid, and we're also looking for opportunities to lean on all that authentic authenticity that we've been researching and throwing, showing to the audience, and making up something totally imaginary. But everything in in episode six diverges from you know Edo period, but manage to hold everybody's you know suspend that disbelief because of everything that had come before it. so that we could create this crazy maze of of uh you know traps and action so yeah i'm i'm behind toby and behind jane they were very very complicated it, it, those two episodes depended heavily on the other episodes that we had established everything in the world already for me i i would say i would actually uh switch a little bit not switch but can kind of change a little bit the the, the question uh for me it was five the most fun to work on and it was of course difficult but it was the most fun to 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 work on all of them so yeah just wait we had fun it. you said fun what show were you on I was just kidding guess to say like fun It was it was fun. It was the most the most fun of, of, of all of them that I worked. But you had fun. There's no fun on season two. You better you better take that somewhere. There's, there's no fun and there's no crying. <laughs> two things that we don't do here. <laughs> season two stands for no fun, no crying. Season two. <laughs> um, Yeah, six. I would imagine would be so difficult because I remember watching five, catching my breath, and then realizing that the show continued after that, <laughs> and and then having to to max that pace, keep it going, not be taken out of it. Um, again, from a viewer, from a fan, I wasn't. I mean, I I breezed through it like that, uh, and I remember talking with um, uh, Alex, the, the Alex Alvarez, or. our wonderful founder over here at Nomen about it and we were just geeking back and forth about uh the pacing and how amazing it was and how it just felt like um it was it was a seamless movie it was one of those situations which i'm sure you've all experienced where you start something and then when you end it you go outside and you're like i need to get some sun and there's no sun cuz now it's nighttime and you're like wait how did that happen <laughs> i was only watching it for an hour but no you watched eight episodes straight through <laughs> so i just want to mention to the chat i see all the questions about season 2 I see them all. Uh we've already been told that it's under lock and key. So any insight on where they're going to be, how the color palette's going to be when they get there, who we're going to hear about, will the storylines continuing in season 2, all that stuff. I see the questions. I'm just sure that I, if I ask them, probably not going to get answered. So uh I think we should just that that's that's a fair assumption, right? Let me just say that I I love that everyone is so excited about season 2 mm. and that we will try very hard not to disappoint. Um we know where the story has to go, we know what we want to do and we just need everyone to to, to be patient and stay tuned. <laughs> be patient and stay tuned. So we know about the pitfalls of 3DS Max. Is there any advantages of working in a software like 3ds Max? <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> None. Remember how we told you we worked with the cards we were dealt, Chris? <laughs> I mean, you know, less Would not uh, recommend. <laughs> less uh less graphic card usage maybe. <laughs> I I I I'm so you know i'm i'm so proud of the fact that not only was this show hard but it's like then 3d studio max made it even harder and it was like every step of the way there was some kind of difficulty 
put in front of us, but this team never gave up. This team found creative solutions to get where we needed to go. And I also think that that's also why if you look at the medium age of our team, we're all, there's, it's all very middle-aged because, you know, you need that, you need that experience to know exactly what you're going in for. I and mean, it's not to say that you can't be a young person and not be that talented. You can, but experience just means, oh, I've gone down there before. I know what happens when I do that, you know? Mm. Season Smart. one is like Mizu working with her weights. We had the weights right. on for season yeah. <laughs> the weights are coming off, right? Yeah. As far as, as far as the question about season two, I think one one thing that I admire about how the show came out and how it was run and how it initiated was that the the audience was never underestimated. The audience was treated with an intellectual respect that you know they were going to connect the dots. This was there was no playing down to the audience or trying to anticipate what the audience would want. So if any for all those questions about season two, I would say like, you know, trust in, in your own ability to get this intellectually because um, I think I think anything right now would be a spoiler anyway. It's it, the anticipation for me to see what's going to come next as an audience is like, I just can't wait, but I have to, it's, it's come. <laughs> Just as a, as a quick aside, uh, there are two people in the chat. I'm assuming your name is Kate Mizu, and it's not Kate Mizu, because that I, mean, I may be wrong, but they are saying that their name is Mizu, and they also happen to be a half Japanese woman. So they connected very directly with the character. Oh. And also, we have two chat members from uh, Japan, and one of them has uh, Mizu in the name, but it seems like a, it seems like Mizu like for watercolor. And then anime, so I, I'm not sure. But shout out to the Mizus in the chat. Um, and to kind of round out the questions that aren't going to get answered, um, I have a question that that comes and in, in populated a few times. Who really betrayed Mizu? Everyone's been wondering and pondering about it and curious about it. Uh, some people debated that it's the mother. Some people debated it was the the fiance, the the to to be wed. Is there any is there any theories or is this more of like an inception situation where the tops just spin it at the end and it's whatever mm -hmm. it's whoever you think it is? It's the world that betrayed Mizu. We did it, everyone. That was the yeah. that was the best answer. That was such a good that like honestly though, that really is that that yeah, because how could you not matter. have that takeaway? Right, because it didn't matter who it was, it really was the mm -hmm. world that right. betrayed me through it was the world that made her who she was right mm -hmm. and, and in all actuality those two people were just a drop in the pond of the long line of people exactly. that have been treating her the exact same way exactly uh, that's cool uh, chris <laughs> <laughs> you know i really uh, appreciate this therapy session that i've had with y'all you've saved me a lot of money uh, <laughs> and you know i I can only say I, I really hope we're going to have you back after season two uh, because this was just so, so phenomenal. This is, again, it's, it's really hard to express that these things that, you know, you grow up with and that mean a lot to you when people take them and do stuff with them, they're, they're taking things that they may not understand how they're bending and molding it much like how you bake bread, I would say, right? Uh, and you have to have respect for that stuff. And talking with you all, it, I, would be, I would be a buffoon to believe that all of you did not have respect, not only for the subject matter, but like you said, for us as an audience, you didn't treat us like we were fools. You didn't treat us like we were less than. You put us all on the same level and, and I just, I applaud you all for that. And I thank you all for that. And I'm so excited for season two. And I'm, again, I thank you all so much for being here. I do have one final question and, and we'll put up all the, the listings. Um, if people have more questions for you, can, can, they, can they reach out to you? And, and where could they possibly reach out to you at? <laughs> 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 
Instagrams. That's how you kids do it, right? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Oh, oh, so so yeah, so so I think the the best way the the our biggest takeaways from this evening is hit up Netflix so we can get that art book, y'all. Stay supporting Blue Eyed Samurai because you never know, season two might turn into season three, and I mean. Again, I can't thank you all enough for being here. It's been so phenomenal. I think as a last send off, I would appreciate if each one of you could give us a little bit of advice. If somebody was trying to be in your shoes, somebody is watching today and they want, what advice would you give them to try and get from just getting out of college, just going into high school and realizing that they want to do this? If they want to be, the next Jane, the Brian, the next Toby, so on. What advice would you would you give that person? James, go for it. I think for my career, it's always been looking for those opportunities where you can bring something into your process of if you're a designer, if you look for the opportunities to create something that will help support that story and um, keep working on looking because being an artist is about seeing as you know, you, you'll use 3d max, you use whatever the, your medium is to do it. But it's, it's about looking, seeing and learning. And you know, it's, you get out of school and you just begin to start to, to learn. It's learning, learning, learning. It's, it's a joy to be, um, to learn about this stuff, go into these worlds. And like you, like you were saying, Chris, it's just, we get we got to go in there with and with the respect and love for for all the content and the characters and uh, especially when a story like this came along where it's so well written and so well um, you know come up with so yeah keep looking for the opportunities to to um, design something great. Daniel, what about you? I would just say that uh, if you get into this industry and obviously you're going to have some not exciting assignments, uh, try, try to have fun with whatever you get and try to be creative because your next assignment is going to be a lot juicier, a lot better, and people will recognize what efforts you put and your creativity can go so far, so far, uh, you know, ahead of, of, of many other people around or whatever. It's not about competition. It's about love, love into what you do. And then you progress a lot easier when you do that. That's my message. <laughs> great. Brian? Um, it's a great question. I, I'd say... Um, as you grow as an artist and get into the industry, um, don't fall into the trap of judging your worth against other artists. There's always going to be better artists. So just judge your growth. You know, take a look at a drawing that you did a year ago and note how much you've improved because you kept drawing. Um, and that will keep you growing and learning and like what everyone else is saying. Um, but just, you know, focus on yourself and your talent and um, be inspired by others, but uh, don't let them define your worth. Toby. Uh, just to bounce off of what the rest of the gang has been saying, I've got a, a quote that I kind of live by, by Milt Call, where it's, you know, whatever you're doing and what the thing that I try to do is you learn so much about your subject that you don't need the reference anymore, you know, and that's where, you know, the, that's the learning and you learn from school, you learn from your research that you do. And like Brian's saying, you learn from the artists around you. Uh, and it's all about just doing your best, giving your all and, uh, you know, doing, doing what's best for the story. Tell those great stories, push, push this industry, challenge each other so that uh, we have more fun stuff to work on. 
And I will add that um, it sounds so cheesy, but you got to be able to listen to yourself and listen to that inner voice. And that's usually the hardest thing for an artist to do because you have to trust yourself. In order to trust yourself, you have to have confidence in yourself. In order to have confidence, you know, it's a whole kind of therapy thing that you're, that, you know, we have to get into. But I know I couldn't make the show 10 years ago because I wasn't in that space. I, I didn't trust my own instinct as much. Once you can get into that space of trusting your own instinct, which comes from what all these guys are talking about, which is, is, is your skill set where it needs to be? Have you mastered what you need to master? All that stuff has to come into play before you start accepting yourself, before you start learning to trust your own instinct to say, yes, this is the right thing to do. And I think, I think the thing I brought onto the show was the steadfast of, no, we're going this way, we're going this way, we're going this way. And I never flinched because I had to trust my instinct. And it's, it's scary because I don't know if it was going to work. Thank God it worked, but, you know, trusting your own voice. I think, and with that, that's a great place to end. Again, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you all for everyone that watched. We are so excited to have, have brought this to you all. Uh, if you want to watch it, I know a couple of you were asking if it was going to be replayed. It's going to be available uh, on our YouTube channel, so you can check it out there. If you're curious about what Noman can do for you, go ahead and hit us up at noman.edu or any of our socials at Noman underscore school. And uh, I guess we'll see you after season two. Watch Blue Eyes Samurai right now on Netflix. Watch it again. You already watched it. Watch it again. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you.